Kathy, thank you very much for joining us today. In considering the role of long-term investors in Asia's growth, do you see that there is a lot of investment taking place right now? And how and where do you see it growing? Well, I think um, the reality of the global economy is such that there has been an enormous um, dependence on using the monetary policy tool to uh, avert a crisis, to stimulate growth, whether you look at the United States, Europe, Japan, uh, much of Asia uh, is doing something similar. And so when you bring interest rates to very low, sometimes artificially low levels, you're going to uh, obviously see um, pools of liquidity uh, that have um, perhaps limited options uh, for allocation, uh, say in a domestic economy or within a small you know, sort of uh, context. So I think that the reality of this very easy uh, monetary environment that we've been living in for the last several years since the global financial crisis, uh, the upshot is there is a lot of liquidity globally, uh, and in some cases, not a lot of obvious destinations for that money to flow. Um, now, however, as we've kind of um, progressed with time, there's been more of a normalization process, be it in the developed economies uh, or elsewhere. Now there's a little bit of confidence or certainty that uh, we sense at the micro level that's coming back uh, to corporate executives, for instance, who are now uh, sitting with very healthy balance sheets. If you look at especially the US, even companies in Europe, the biggest companies in Europe, the biggest companies in Japan, they're awash with liquidity. Um, and if uh, confidence does come back, now they have the ability to decide, so do I invest? Um, if the answer is yes, do I invest at home or do I go abroad? Uh, in the Jap Japanese context, uh, particularly because the yen had been so strong, there was uh, no desire to invest at home and every desire to go abroad, especially in uh, the rest of Asia. So the FDI flow uh, pool was very, very large. And uh, coupled with that, of course, is M&A. And so you're seeing not only the, the, the flush liquidity you know, factors at play, but also the reality that globalization is speeding everything up. So if you're a predominantly domestic manufacturer or domestic service provider in any economy, especially in, in Asia, uh, you've been forced to look abroad and perhaps rather than greenfield approach, building from scratch, uh, reinventing the wheel yourself, you acquire uh, another business um, that already exists and invest and grow that way. So I think the bottom line is we're going to continue to see uh, more and more liquidity, uh, desperately seeking you know, high return investment destinations, whether it's direct investment, portfolio investment, uh, most of the region's saving, uh, uh, savings pools, be it the household sector and the corporate sector are uh, pretty healthy. Uh, so. Uh, trying to find um, appropriate destinations for this excess cash and excess liquidity, I think, is going to be uh, the challenge ahead. So do you see that the flows that we've seen from uh, some of these uh, places that have been flushed with cash are right. going to continue to come to Asia? Or, you know, is Asia now getting a little bit less attractive? Yeah, I think, you know, speaking um, in my role with um, a lot of institutional investors globally, whether they work for pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, mutual funds in America, uh, etc., cetera, um, I think the bottom line is even though Asia perhaps have had, has had some uh, reassessments or, you know, people are questioning, you know, is, what's China's long-term growth potential, uh, what's going to happen to India, et cetera, uh, I think very few people would uh, disagree with the statement that Asia is going to continue to lead uh, global growth uh, going forward. Um, however, I do think that people are wondering, so rather than uh, everywhere is homogenous in Asia, there is clearly differentiation uh, at work. Uh, you see that differentiation happening in places like China versus, say, India, or um, uh, India versus ASEAN, uh, North Asia versus South Asia. So I think in global investors are without a doubt still very focused on the region for investments, portfolio and direct. Uh, but I think they're being a bit more nuanced, uh, I guess is the right word, in terms of where to um, uh, 
you know, dedicate their investments uh, going forward. Um, there clearly is a need for infrastructure. There clearly is a need for environmental uh, related investments. Um, the growth opportunities are vast, but there's also a lot of complications, whether it is, you know, current account and, and budget deficits in countries, uh, currencies that are still, you know, uh, not, not very stable. The perception is they're not stable, or perhaps perceptions that governments are not stable, or leadership is lacking. So there's a lots of shades of gray, but uh, so that, that I think will color uh, where exactly these flows from outside of Asia eventually um, uh, get directed toward. Looking at Japan, I mean, Japan has been very interesting to watch this past year mm -hmm. simply because so much has happened and with Abenomics, mm -hmm. we were actually seeing the effects quite quickly. Right. Do you think that the, the policies that uh, Abe has put in are, are working and are they, su are they sustainable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, first of all, I think before I answer the question, are those uh, Abenomics policies working? I think we have to go back to the um, sort of a, a origination of what is Abenomics and what is the intent here of this whole agenda, this whole campaign. And for me, I think it is very simple, and that is uh, if you've got these huge uh, headwinds which are facing an economy that are called the demographic challenges, the very large fiscal uh, burden that the nation carries, there is really no way you're going to come out of any of those uh, challenges if your economy remains mired in a deflation trap. So very simply for us, Abenomics is this mission to simply get Japan out of deflation and hopefully grow the economy on a more sustainable basis uh, through reforms. So that's sort of in a nutshell what I think is the definition. So to answer your question, do I think it's working? Well, uh, so far, uh, what we've seen is the stock market's up over 70% from its lows in the past 12 months. We've seen the property market go from stagnation to now people are buying condominiums, they're taking up mortgages, prices, commercial, residential, almost across the nation are actually uh, lifting finally after a long uh, period of malaise. Uh, department store sales of luxury goods. You know, you thought Japanese were satiated, but it doesn't seem like. <laughs> so they've come back and luxury goods sales are up in some cases 15, 20, 25% uh, year on year. So, uh, and of course the currency has finally reversed course. So it's no longer 75, $80 yen. It's more like uh, 95, 100 uh, range, which obviously is very helpful for a lot of the uh, uh, segments of exporters in Japan. So, so far, the policies that have been applied do appear to be working to help get Japan out of uh, deflation. But the second uh, answer, or part of the answer, of course, is, is it sustainable? Uh, and, and clearly, to make it sustainable, Japan faces the exact same challenges that the United States faces with uh, QE and exiting from QE that, that Europe faces with its uh, challenges as well, and that is, these what I call economic policy or macro policy tools, of course, help you kickstart your economy, uh, um, can um, buy a bit of time, but those policy tools we all know alone in and of themselves are not going to drive sustained growth. So this to me is an opportunity while Japan is recovering, use that time to your advantage to take some of the more difficult decisions. Difficult meaning they've got to uh, pursue reforms that are going to upset some very uh, deep vested interests in the economy, say the, the agricultural lobby, or Japan probably needs to restart some of its nuclear facilities, but there's a very powerful anti-nuclear lobby still in Japan. So there are lots of areas that need to be uh, you know, they need to make progress on in the structure reform agenda area, but they certainly aren't going to all be easy battles to win. But I think that that's going to be the next uh, challenge for uh, the Abe regime. And do you think that there is the political will to do that and also the willingness among Japanese people to, to live with those mm -hmm. kinds of reforms? Well, I, I think that's the million dollar question, you know, is there enough political leadership, which clearly has been sorely lacking for many, many years in, in Japan. Um, but I think that 
um, one factor in particular, I believe that the combination of A, the European sovereign crisis, which I think really hammered home to the average Mrs. Watanabe uh, in Japan because that European crisis, the streets of Athens on fire, the Spanish youth unemployment, that was broadcast to the nth de detail into everybody's living rooms for the last you know, two or three years, uh, meaning that Japan, we all know, has much larger debt to GDP ratio than any of these peripheral European economies uh, had. And yet, J Japanese people thought, well, it's okay, we're, we're living fine, um, that's their problem, not ours, until it wasn't, right? Until you saw what happened in Europe. So I think that reality check was very helpful to create a sense of urgency. And the second was probably Tohoku, the disaster, which um, you don't think a natural disaster would have that kind of impact, but the number one impact, of course, was to shut down all nuclear power, which meant from 30% of Japan's you know, electricity generation to zero overnight. And that meant that Japan had to make up that shortfall by importing very expensive fossil fuels, which caused the trade account to go from the black to the red. Um, and of course, Japan cannot continue to sustain this very high debt to GDP ratio if the current account goes into deficit. Uh, the current account's still in surplus today, but people are now you know, taking bets on, on how the, that's going to continue. So I think those events probably um, uh, culminated in public uh, the consciousness of Japanese people saying, okay, enough is enough. And I think the LDP, Prime Minister Abe uses uh, the quote from Margaret Thatcher, Tina, there is no alternative. Or you go to the LDP's headquarters and I get told, this is you know, Japan's last chance. You, know, you don't have to speak Japanese to understand those words. So there is a sense of much greater urgency this time around versus you know, previous sort of attempts to do these uh, structural reforms. There is no question though, they're not going to win every single battle. There's no question that this is going to take multiple years you know, to execute the agenda. But at the minimum, finally, we have a government who wants to drive the economy into inflation, out of deflation, and B, wants to try to fight some of these difficult battles uh, with the aim of hopefully giving Japanese people uh, a brighter outlook uh, for their futures. All right, Kathy, we have to leave it there. Thanks very okay. much for joining us. Thank you very much.